I want to thank everyone for coming to this presentation on FDA compliance. What I'm going to talk about with this are 22 tips for writing for FDA compliance. And this specifically is from my background. I'm an auditor. I'm an investigator. I write investigation reports. This is part of a training program that goes to pharmaceutical companies in how do your people perform investigations and how they write that data down. The best investigation is only as good as the documented evidence of how you performed it and the conclusions that you draw from it. So that being said, let me continue with this. If you have any questions, go to our website. It's compliance-insight.com. Again, it's compliance-insight.com. And we will um, have some information on there about how to do this. There's a lot more tips. There's some stuff that you can download. A lot of useful information there. So what this presentation is going to cover is why we document things. If we don't document or document poorly, what are the consequences of that good writing overview and report writing tips? Obviously, that's the key point to this whole thing. Why do we document things? It is the law. Thou shalt document. The, the number one rule in, in pharmaceutical operations, I keep hitting people with this over the head constantly, if it is not documented, it is just a rumor. You have to document everything that you do. Again, if it is conducted very well, all the testing is performed great, you, you do the platinum level investigation, but if you document that work poorly, then it's going to be reviewed as very poorly. Part of the, the GMPs 211-182, a written record of the investigation shall be made and shall include the conclusions and follow-up. And there's some guidance out there from the FDA about how to deal with out-of-spec test results, how to do things. A lot of this comes from experience, experience, experience. That's how you are a good investigator. Formal documentation, the goal of documenting things is to clearly describe the issue or the problem. What happened? The pathways taken during the investigation. What did you do? Even if you went down a pathway and it worked out, everything was in control, you should state that. Don't just state that, yeah, we went down this way and found that this is the problem. No one then knows that you went down five other ways looking at different areas unless you document it and found that those areas were indeed compliant. You are accentuating the positive. You have to include your kappa items. You have to have a conclusion. Don't just assume the reader is going to conclude the same conclusion you do. Prevents errors due to oral communication. Uh, it, it's like tribal knowledge. You're passing down information from person to person to person. It doesn't work. It prevents errors due to informal documentation. Writing things up, uh, little memos written here or there, those are things that don't connect sometimes. So a formal documentation, a program wrapping everything up, combines all that into a narrative that clearly describes what happened and what steps you took. Poor documentation examples, none. The first example I would have is that you have nothing in place. I'm not sure it would be worse than having nothing in place would be to have stuff that's confusing. Sometimes having nothing may be the, the lesser of two evils rather than confusing people or, or unclear, vague. What are the consequences of that? You release a bad product. You reject good products. You have legal issues. Certainly FDA, 43s, warning letters, all those types of things. Your reputation in the FDA's eyes and definitely in the public goes down. These are all just outcomes of poor documentation. So what are you going to document? I can tell you in all GMP related operations, you're going to do a lot. Manufacturing, packaging, testing anything along the line, investigations, complaints. In the box here, I put down something very true. You're going to document just about everything in pharmaceutical operations. 
especially those dealing with quality. If you make a GMP decision on data, then you document it. You've got to have documented data showing what you did, why you did it. The top 22 tips for documentation. Here we go. We're going to start with these. Number one, be clear, concise, and timely. Very clearly laid out in the FDA guidance on this. Clear, concise, and that timely is very critical. If you don't have it down in a procedure that thou shalt conclude an investigation within a specified period of time before it is highlighted that there needs to be maybe re more resources to it or it, it goes to a, a different level of investigation, then you're in fault. You are in definitely not with the current GMPs. You have to have timely there. What's timely? I've seen everything from 15 days to 30 days. And some of that depends upon complexity of the operations and what you're dealing with. Number two, clearly summarize the issue. Not, I'm not talking about what you did in the investigation. I'm saying the issue. What was the issue? Sometimes I've read investigation reports doing inspections, and I got to the end of it, and I thought, I'm, I'm not sure I clearly understood what the issue was. It sounds like there may be two or three issues. What's going on? Make sure it's clear, concise. If I can get my 10-year-old daughter to understand it, then I've done well in conveying the investigation summary, why I did the investigation. Clear, bullet point it, make it understood by everyone. Include all pertinent items found during the investigation. Everything, all the pertinent in, in items. Now remember we were in school, we had story problems. A train left Philadelphia heading toward Atlanta at 55 miles an hour over blah, blah, blah. And you had to figure this out. Well, also included sometimes in those story problems were the train left Philadelphia doing 55 miles an hour and the conductor was wearing red shoes and a blue hat and there were four people on board. That, that's not pertinent information. Don't include the per, that extraneous information. Only include pertinent information in the investigation. Have a conclusion. Uh, if you don't have a conclusion, then you've missed, there by my animation, the key to success is saying this is what you found during the investigation. This is what happened. This is our conclusion. If you don't have a conclusion, I can tell you right now, the FDA is going to make one for you because they'll conclude what it is in their own mind, and it may not necessarily be the one that you want. Number five, indicate kappa. This is critical in a perspective that you have to have kappa items down the root cause, the understanding of how did you fix it to prevent it from happening elsewhere, and it has to be systemic kappa. You have to have effectiveness checks. All those things are very critical. This has to be approved by QA, the investigation, plus other people who are critical to that particular investigation. QA has to review all of these things. Then you have other people. Or I say QA, I mean the quality unit. It has to be, if it's a production issue, it has to be signed by someone in production. Now you do not want to have casts of thousands signing this. You want to have critical people that are overseeing the department or department heads signing this. It has to be communicated to the appropriate people. Who are the appropriate people? Management, department heads, other sites particularly might have an interest in this. Don't have other people in other areas reinvent the wheel because they have failures. Highlight things to other people so that everybody is aware of it. Management is critical that they be aware of all investigations, certainly at a high level, that they are aware of what's going on in their company. Number eight, do not assume anything. The reader may not know the process 
or may not know it very well. They may not know the product. They don't know the history. There's a lot in there. I'm not talking about going to the nth degree, defining everything, but I'm saying make it clear enough that a person reviewing it that doesn't understand the process can at least look at it and gleam the necessary information that they can draw a conclusion with the conclusion that you've put in the investigation report. Number nine, Use charts, tables, graphs, whatever it is. A picture says a thousand words. The flip side of that coin is be careful because putting tables, graphs, charts in there that it conveys the information that you want it to convey. I've seen data go in tables into investigation reports that highlighted another issue going on. They highlighted problems that were being overlooked. So make sure that the data you put in there is reflecting the point that you want it to reflect. Number 10, do not use slang, jargon, anything along that line. If there's some acronym you put in there, highlight what that means. Uh, XYZ in parentheses means whatever that means. Don't let the person sit there and say, what, what does that mean? Uh, a good example of that is GDP. It could mean good documentation practices, or it can also mean good distribution practices. So highlight what that means, even if you think everyone should be aware of it. Back up your findings with evidence, data, don't draw a conclusion without the facts being presented as you see them. Do not exaggerate. This is the best product on the world. Everything has worked so well with it. We've never had a problem ever anywhere in the history of this company. Those are all exaggerations. State only the facts. State the scope of the problem or the issue. How far out does this go? What am I looking at? What is the scope of this particular situation? Number 14, outline the root cause. How did you come to that root cause? How do you know it doesn't go any further than that? A lot of times people put the error in the root cause by saying, ah, it's training related or it's people related. No, it's a system related. And uh, people have gotten into some big issues by putting everything as people related because people made the error. No, there was training involved, there was oversight involved, there's procedures involved. How did you as management not know that there was a problem there? It can go on and on and on. Make sure you get to the true root cause. Indicate the kappa, a systemic approach. Earlier indicating that, state your kappa with this. It's coming up here again because it is very hot topic. Systemic approach has to be taken with the kappa. If it is not, then your investigation report is deficient. Look at the report. Does it flow well? Paragraphs connected. That it's a story that you're telling the reader. This is what we did. Make sure it flows well. Don't just jump area to area, then go back to area. There's no flashbacks in writing an investigation. This isn't a novel. There's no forward thing. There are none of these things that you think of in a, 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 some type of novel or a book. This is a report. Make sure it just flows well and everything reads very well. Use bullet points. I am a big proponent of bullet points. I state the topic, what I'm looking at. These were the things found. Point, 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 point. It's very easy to follow. It makes the statement. It doesn't add a lot of verbiage to it. And it makes it the investigation report shorter and more succinct. Number 18, list all the key dates and times of the investigation. What happened? When was this first uh, detected? When did you start the investigation? When did you put things on hold? When did you stop operations? When did you recall? Well, any of those key things. When did you look at this stuff? When did people know 
what was going on and it's very critical times in there is dependent upon the nature of the the situation if it's critical to put a time in there then put it in there if not use key dates just building upon those key dates number 19 here is the timeline of the investigation make sure that people understand what happened especially really long and complex investigations put that in there wrap it up make sure that the timeline is in there so that people truly can follow what you did when you did it and that there are no big gaps in the timeline that you started the investigation at the beginning of the month and you then started looking at operations at the end of the month well why was there a two three week gap in there that's what's going to get you in trouble unless you explain it and hopefully you have good explanation for that if not then you you possibly have an issue number 20 contain copies of reference data again if you have data you want to put it in there put the copies of where you got this stuff especially if you get it out of a book uh, off of some uh, discussion point that was made and something else put the copy in there don't make people go back and try to find your reference data because that book gets lost the website gets changed whatever it is make sure that you keep the copies there it's hard documented evidence number 21 contain copies of Kappa items if you've done training put the training in if you've done purchase items put that in employee issues we've uh, given a person a, a reprimand no do not put that in there that's personnel data that's HR data that's not for the investigation don't open yourself up for people to go into HR by putting HR stuff in your investigation very critical and number 22 be all inclusive to the incident don't stop just because you think you found the problem make sure you put everything in everything you looked at across the board and don't include extraneous stuff in there say oh well looking at this I noted that which is another issue if you put that in there it's going to lead right down that path you open the door for another evaluation of another issue open another investigation if you found another problem but don't include it in this unless it's pertinent if it's not associate it with the incident don't include it investigate it separately how to write things place yourself in the background look at it you're writing for someone else to read use nouns and verbs minimal use of adjectives and adverbs uh, anything that would highlight this is really good or this is exceptionally fantastic all these types of things are not necessary they're in control or they're not in control revise 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 let other people not involved with the issue review it so you get a, a good understanding back from people not associated with the situation and remember the next person to read this report is probably going to be an FDA inspector you want to make sure that it flows very well and it's clear avoid local type of wording technologically advanced wording trust me I have a lot of experience a lot of background but sometimes people write things in these investigations that I look at it and say well, what what is that and it's ah it's it's cutting edge technology description of this if you're going to do that at least add a little bit of uh, clarification in there as to what that is the next bullet point very critical do not inject opinion this is a fact based report only it is not in my opinion this is done that's great if you want to go to court and argue things if you want to write a position paper to have it published on the internet great I don't care what you do with the opinion but when you come to me with an investigation you come with facts everyone has an opinion I only want the facts spell out abbreviations don't uh, think that people understand everything spell it out be specific to the issue instead of the product didn't meet specifications what specification what 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 was it a better type of thing is the product 
Fugadium bromide, this is my own product, uh, tablets, 10 milligrams, did not meet potency specs of 92 to 102% as dictated in the USP. The results were as follows, point, 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 very clear, very detailed as to what happened. Select a format, stick with it. Don't bring people three investigation reports and have three different formats. Uh, the report format, an introduction, outline of the investigation, a summary of the investigation, a conclusion, and a kappa. This is sort of me with a format that I put together. Everyone does it a little differently. It really doesn't matter as long as you hit some of the high points that I'm detailing here with a format. Make sure you hit those things. Put statements in a positive form. I always was taught don't put howevers and buts. Uh, it, everything worked but this. Uh, negative points. Write it in a positive. We were in control with this. We did do this properly. And hopefully you have those things. Use definite, specific language. Be very clear as to what you're trying to say. Don't include needless wording or statements. It's great to write a whole bunch of stuff. Sometimes people get very fluid in writing things and it sounds really good, but it's a lot of needless wording. Check your data, check your data, check your data. Calculation errors, wrong data, wrong conclusions. Make sure that you check that. The next reader certainly is going to be an auditor. Begin with the end in mind, meaning what's your goal? Your goal is to understand what specifically happened and you're putting all the data together to draw the conclusion, which probably is already done as you're writing this investigation report. Include all areas in the investigation, even those that resulted in no issues noted. Indicate results, expected ranges, specifications, whatever it is. If you need more information, if you need help, give us a call. Here's our phone number. Call us up. We offer a free phone consultation on these types of issues. If you have a real issue, call us. Let us know how we can be of assistance. Go to our website. If you go through it, there's a lot of useful information. There's a lot of downloadable stuff. There's a lot of tips, help, examples. All that's there. Shoot us an email. Someone will be getting back to you as quickly as we can. And if you need real help, you call us. We'll set up some type of discussion with you. We can have a phone conference call. We can go through your specific issues. We can sign a quick CDA, confidentiality agreement, just to say, yeah, we won't discuss this with other people. We do this all the time. We help people out. Give us a chance to help you. We offer this free, a phone consultation. There, there's certainly no obligation to continue with anything. It's just something that we offer to try to help people out. It lets you see what we can do and to help you. And we always think in the future, if you have real need for further help, you'll come to us because we've already demonstrated our capability. Anyway, hopefully this has been helpful. Hopefully you'll get some good information, some good topics on this. Let us know if you have any questions, and thank you very much for going through this.